Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentary films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. Yes, a very warm welcome at the Bali. My name is Yuri Albrecht. I'm the director of the Bali, and I'm very, very um, honored that I can uh, tell you that uh, Kishore Mababani is here and that he will speak um, to us and with us. Um, it's very... Um, I heard him speak several times over the years. He is, uh, to my opinion, one of the most interesting voices, international voices, to be heard. Um, he has been writing for decades already on um, the global developments, and he's been um, actually um, foreseeing the future in many ways. Um, things who uh, we see materialized today, he has been describing for more than a decade, for more than 15 years ago. Um, it's always nice to, uh, to, um, to write about the world, but um, about, about the world in your own time. But the thing is that if you live long enough, you have to prove that the pudding is in the eating. And in, uh, in respect to Dr. Kishore Mababani, um, it's extraordinary how he was able to predict things uh, decades ago. Things about the rise of Asia, things about the demise of the West, things about how the West has lost its ways. And he's here to talk about his newest booklet. He wrote very huge and heavy books, but he, he's written a booklet recently, Has the West Lost Its Way? Is it Westen de Weg Kwijt? It's been translated and just published. Um, and uh, he says that it's a pamphlet and a provocation. And I think that's very nice because it's very, very nice to have friends in the world who provo provoke the West, who provoke Europe and, and America uh, in the way uh, Kishore Mabibani does, because he's a big believer in love ideas from the West. He's actually the one who pointed out for a long, long time to us that um, the West, um, uh, I heard him speak several years ago on the seven pillars of Western wisdom, which is a very nice way of putting, putting it. Um, that um, a lot of the, uh, the, the world is actually doing very well, and it's doing very well because of a lot of things the West has done. But has the West lost its way now? And actually, if we look at what happened tonight, there's another bombardment on Syria, and whether we like that or we don't like that, and we can, of course, debate on that, we can have different opinions on that, but um, Dr. Bambabani is writing about these sort of interventions in the rest of the world, what he calls like the West and the rest, uh, already for a long time, and has strong opinions and very uh, interesting opinions on that, so I think it couldn't have been more topical uh, for him to speak to, to us today, although these are developments who's been developing for decades. Um, he is just, um, he's been uh, a diplomat for his home country, Singapore, for um, several uh, decades. He's been chairing, among other things, the United Nations Security Council when he was uh, the president of it in 2001 and 2002. Um, he's been the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. He's been professor of public policy and, um, uh, and has been a diplomat and an academic for a long time. He's on a sabbatical leave now. He's been just to Harvard and other American universities and is here to speak to us this afternoon. Dr. Mababani, if I can ask you to come here and take the chair, we will have a conversation after that. Also with Paul Scheffer, whom I'm going to introduce later on. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri, for that very generous uh, introduction. And let me say that I'm very happy uh, to be back uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, for some, you may not know this, huh? only I can say this. I've actually spoken in many parts of the world. I've actually launched books 
in many parts of the world and in many languages. But I always find that the most hospitable uh, audience I always find is in the Netherlands and especially in Amsterdam. So I'm very happy to be back here uh, once again. <laughs> so I, I, I thank you for receiving me. And as Yuri mentioned, uh, uh, I'm here to launch a new book. You, you've seen the Dutch cover, this is the English cover. Uh, has the West uh, lost it? So what I propose to do, I understand I have 20 minutes uh, to 2.30 or so, is to describe uh, my thesis. But of course, I, I'm going to do something very uh, unusual <laughs> at the beginning. You know, the, the title of my talk and my book is uh, uh, Has the West Lost It? Question mark. And I'm supposed to keep you in suspense to the end before I give you the answer. But let me you know, take away the suspense and give you the answer right away. <laughs> and say, the, the, let me tell you the answer is no. You haven't lost it. Not yet. <laughs> but you may do so. You may do so if you keep on going on uh, autopilot and keep on doing the same things that you've been doing uh, for the past few decades and the past few centuries. So this book is actually, as one of my friends said to me, Kishore, this is your love letter to the West to say, wake up, the world is changing and you have to change and adapt to. So what I propose to do is to put across my thesis uh, in three parts. Uh, I'll try to address uh, three questions. The first question being, uh, why does the West matter? <laughs> I mean, why should we be concerned about the West? At the end of the day, the West only makes up 12% of the world's population. So why do we spend so much time on it? And the second question is basically, I'll try to describe what the West has been doing in recent decades and point out some mistakes that the West has made. And then in part three, I hope to provide some prescriptions or solutions for the West on what can be done uh, to make both uh, lives better for people in the West and people in the rest in the coming decades. And that, that's, that's the outline of my presentation. So let me begin with part one. Why does the West matter? The simple answer is that the West matters because it has been by far the most successful civilization in human history. Frankly, humanity today could very well have been in the dark ages if the West hadn't woken up, transformed itself, and after transforming itself, began the process of transforming the world too. As you know, neither the Chinese, nor the Indian, nor the Islamic civilizations went through the Renaissance, went through the Enlightenment, went through that, all those great transformations. But what they got instead were the fruits of the great Western transformation. So for us in the rest of the world, I do believe that we, the rest of the world, all should send a big thank you note to the West for having made this huge breakthrough. And what is remarkable is that so few people have noticed that the West has now shared its gifts very generously with the rest of the world. And as a result, the human condition, we can go back two or 3,000 years, has never been as good as it is today. And all this is because of the West. So let me, let me describe to you how the world is a much better place today in several dimensions. And I can tell you one thing, eh? this may come as a shock to you. When a future historian from the year 2100 says, looks back on 2018, he will say the people of 2018 are probably the luckiest people because they saw greater improvement in 30 years than any other generation in human history did so. 
There's a big claim. Let me give the data. Okay. Take, for example, the area of war and peace. And you know, wars go back thousands of years. We've been trying to eradicate wars, deaths from conflicts. Seem like a mission impossible. Now let me give you the good news. World peace has come. You may not believe this, so let me give you the data. This is from Harvard's Steven Pinker, who's written extensively two books now on the subject, and I had a long conversation with him in Harvard just two weeks ago. He says, and I quote, today we are probably living in the most peaceful moment of our species time on earth. He adds, global violence has fallen steadily since the middle of the 20th century, according to a human security brief 2006, the number of battle deaths in interstate wars has declined from more than 65,000 per year in the 1950s to less than 2,000 per year in this decade. That's amazing, right? What's even more amazing is that we've been trying to eradicate poverty since the beginning of human history. And for those of you who are alive in the 50s and 60s and remember the great debates about development and how we got to save the third world and you know rescue people from poverty, and then by the 80s and 90s, people began to lose hope and say it cannot be done. Guess what? We did it. And let me give you the data again. This is what Oxford Max Rosa says, in 1950, now that's not so long ago, I was born in 1948, so this is two years after I was born. In 1950, three quarters of the world were living in extreme poverty. In 1981, it was still 44%. In 2016, the research suggests that the share in extreme poverty has fallen below 10%. From 75% in 1950 to 10% in 2016. That's an amazing improvement in the living condition. And I can tell you that I can speak about this with some conviction because when I was born in Singapore, uh, Singapore in the 50s and 60s was a typical third world developing country. Our per capita income was the same as Ghana, $500. I was put on a special feeding program when I was six years old because I was technically undernourished. Now, as you can see, I'm overnourished. <laughs> but I've seen this transformation and lived through it. So that's another huge improvement the human condition. But I can give you some other data. Let me just give you one more quotation so you understand how remarkable our times are. Johan Noberg of the Cato Institute notes, quote, if someone had told you in 1990, 28 years ago, that over the next 25 years, world hunger would decline by 40%, child mortality would half, and extreme poverty would fall by three quarters, you'd have told them that they were a naive fool. But the naive fools were right. This is truly what has happened. So why has it happened? Why has the world become so much better? Because the West shared its gifts with the rest. And if you look at the book, I give a lot of credit, especially to the Western breakthrough in modern reasoning and how modern reasoning spread from the West to the rest and improved lives of people. And this is a very important thing. I can say this because, you know, when I grew up with my parents and their, their sense of the world, their feeling was that if something terrible happens, it's fate. You can't do anything about it. 
You can't change anything. And then we learned. We went to Western Star School. We discovered there's cause and effect. And if there's a problem, you can analyze it, find its roots, and find the solution. And that's how you find solutions to many of the pressing issues that were holding us back. And it's quite remarkable how amazingly, as I said, the human condition has improved. And in the book, I talk about three sort of revolutions that followed the spread of Western reasoning to the rest of the world. One was a political revolution. And what I mean by this political revolution, it wasn't for a long time, especially in Asia, when we were ruled by the kings and queens, they believed that they had a divine right to rule. They never felt that they had any sense of accountability to the people. Thanks to the West, the concept of accountability to the people spread to the world. So even in a communist country like China, right? The Communist Party actually believes that it is accountable to the people. That's a huge difference. Then you begin taking care of the people, you build schools, you build clinics, you build infrastructure. That's what you do when you're accountable to the people. The second revolution is psychological. The sense that, hey, you can improve your lives and move ahead. I've mentioned that. And the third revolution, I'm giving you a very quick run through because I don't have time. But the third revolution has been in the area of good governance. And this too is a concept that the West has shared with the rest of the world. So the result of all this, and this will be clear to a future historian in the year 2100, he will look back at this past three decades and say, hey, the Western project to make the world a more civilized place has succeeded. And therefore, you should be seeing great celebrations in the West today. <laughs> but as you know, and as I know, the West is so depressed. In fact, I believe it's in a deep funk. And again, this will be a great puzzle to the future historian. He'll say, what happened? The Western project succeeded globally, and the West is so depressed. Clearly. The West has lost its way in some ways. And the question, therefore, is what mistakes has the West made? And so this is part two of my presentation. And I'll talk about the mistakes that the West has made. Of course, you can list many, but I'll highlight what I call three strategic mistakes that the West made. The first strategic mistake was at the end of the Cold War. And as you know, the end of the Cold War was a major turning point for the West. There was, you know, you remember 1990, the West was in such a celebratory, triumphalist mood. The essay by Francis Fukuyama came out, end of history, we, the world history has ended, we're all going to become liberal democratic societies. The West can now relax. The rest has got to struggle, but we succeeded. We made it. One of the most cruel things I say in the book is that Francis Fukuyama's essay did a lot of brain damage to the West because it made the West complacent at precisely the moment of history, 1990, when China and India were waking up. And why is that so important? Because from the year one to the year 1820, for 1800 out of the last 2000 years, the two largest economies of the world have always been those of China and India. And it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off and America took off. But the last 200 years of world history, when you view them against the backdrop of past 2,000 years of world history, have been a major historical 
aberration. All aberrations come to a natural end. And that's happening right now. As you and I speak. Just give you one statistic. In 1980, the United States share of the global GNP was 25%. China's share of the global GNP in 1980, in BPP terms, was 2.2%. United States was 10 times larger than by 2014, 2015, China's share became larger than the United States and nobody noticed that the world had changed in the last 30 years, right? That's an amazing change. And in 2008, in PPP terms, India became the third largest economy in the world. Nobody noticed. So, at a time when the world was going through a magnificent transformation, Francis Fukuyama's essay put the West to sleep. The second strategic mistake happened in 2001. Another critical year in human history. I suspect when, if I ask you all what happened in 2001, most of the answers I get is, oh, it's pretty obvious what happened in 2001. 9-11 happened in 2001, right? Osama bin Laden organized the operation. The World Trade Center towers came crashing down. Actually, my wife and I were in Manhattan when it happened. We didn't see the towers come down, but we were there. And it was a shock to America. A huge shock. And suddenly, America began to get involved completely in the Islamic world, invading Afghanistan, invading Iraq. And in the process, the United States failed to notice that something more momentous happened in 2001, much more significant. And what was that? It was China's admission into WTO. And when China got admitted into WTO, about 800 million workers were suddenly thrust into the global capitalist system. And then as Joseph Schumpeter taught us, there was creative destruction, jobs were lost, and that's how Trump happened. Right? So if you don't pay attention to the real strategic changes, and you get distracted by 9-11, you get the consequences. And the third strategic mistake that the West made was an even bigger one. It failed to see that in the course of these past few decades, as a result of all the great transformations I described to you in part one of my lecture, that the world has become a small, densely interconnected global village. Everything now hangs together. Whatever you do, you have to look at the total picture and not try to view problems in their slices. Whatever you do has got consequences somewhere else. You take an action here, it has a consequence somewhere else. And to give you a, a good example, if America had been strategically awake and aware, as I mentioned, it should have seen that China's admission into WTO would have an amazing impact. China's economy would grow, and therefore America should have focused on China, right? Instead, I can tell you, as you know, the United States decided in 2003 to invade Iraq. And on the day when it, uh, after, it admit, after it invaded Iraq, it discovered that it couldn't, Iraq, it couldn't export Iraqi oil because there were Security Council sanctions on Iraq, and therefore America worked hard to lift the sanctions. It was difficult. The Security Council was badly divided at the time. On the day when the sanctions were lifted, I asked the senior American diplomat in charge of this, say, who helped you? So I thought he would say, oh, Britain helped me, France helped me, Germany helped me. No, he said it was China that helped America. 
And I tell you this story for one reason. Because it will show you how China was paying attention to the big picture and America wasn't. Because by lifting the sanctions on Iraq, number one, China's got immediate reward because America squeezed Taiwan. I can tell you more about that later. But more importantly, the Chinese wanted to legitimize the American presence in Iraq to ensure that America remained bogged down in Iraq while China kept growing. And I can tell you, I gave you the data in, in, in uh, PPP terms. Let me give you the data in nominal terms, okay? It's an even more amazing story. In the year 2000, America's GNP was eight times bigger than China's, one year before China got admitted in WTO. By 2015, America was just 1.6 times bigger. And within 10 years, China's will become bigger. So instead of paying attention to China, America got distracted. And that's why you have all these challenges coming our way. So the question therefore now is, and I'll try to do this in five minutes, uh, what should the West do? And I have proposed in the book that the West should adopt a new 3M strategy. 3M stands for, not, not for the Minnesota Mining Company in Minnesota, but it stands for three words beginning with M. The first M is minimalist. And this is a very critical point. In one way or another, the West has basically intervened in the affairs of the rest of the globe for 200 years, right? It's a fact. I mean, you, you in Netherlands know this well. You colonized Indonesia, right? So far away. The other side of the world, you colonized them. You could do it. Today is inconceivable, right? But the habits of the 19th and 20th century continue to linger. And as you mentioned, Paul, sorry, Yuri, they mentioned that uh, today the bombing took place. And how is this bombing going to help either the Syrians or you? Why don't you try to find alternative solutions? And in the book, I say that every time an American ambassador to the UN speaks, I, co I have the exact words in the book, they would say, this is a struggle between the democracies of the world and the tyrannies of Russia and China, right? It's a struggle between good and evil, black and white. Well, I say, okay, if you say this is a struggle between the democracies of the world and the tyrannies of the world, why don't you listen to the uh, number one democracy in the world, the largest democracy in the world, which is India, or the number three democracy in the world, which is Indonesia. <laughs> Why do you only speak of Western democracies? Let me quote to you what an Indian diplomat wrote down. He's a, probably the most, one of the most senior Indian diplomats. His name is Sham Saran. He describes what happens as a result of Western interventions. He says, in most, in most cases, the post-intervention situation has been rendered much worse, the violence more lethal, and the suffering of the people who are supposed to be protected much more severe than before. Iraq is an earlier instance. Libya and Syria are the more recent ones. A similar story is playing itself out in Ukraine. He says, in each case, no careful thought was given to the possible consequences of the intervention. So if you really want to involve the democracies of the world, then why not listen to the largest democracy in the world, which is India, or the third largest democracy, which is Indonesia? And if you listen to them, your worldviews will change, and then you, will, you won't have to get so involved in the affairs of other states. And let me emphasize one point. I must emphasize that your gifts of Western reasoning have worked so well on the rest of the world that these other civilizations will continue succeeding without your intervention. 
and they might even do better. So that's one minimalist. Second, multilateral. And here, it's again, I mentioned, I emphasize to you that the great strategic mistake was not realizing how we're becoming a small interconnected global village. Now, when you become a small interconnected global village, you need a global village councils, right? And where there are, fortunately, there are global village councils. This is the gift, the multilateral order that the West gifted to the world at the end of World War II. United Nations, IMF, World Bank, GATT, World Trade Organization. These are Western gifts to the rest of the world. And amazingly, I know this, I was ambassador to the UN for 10 years. The United States has been steadily undermining or weakening global multilateral institutions. That's a big mistake. And the person who points out that this is a mistake is a former president of America. His name is Bill Clinton, and I quote him in the book. He says, if America assumes it's going to be number one forever, then just keep doing what you're doing. Doesn't matter. Be unilateral. Then Bill Clinton added a but. He said, but if you can conceive of a world where you're no longer number one, then it's in America's national interest to strengthen multilateral rules, multilateral procedures, multilateral institutions. He gave this advice in 2003 in a speech in Yale 15 years ago. No one has ever repeated that advice since Bill Clinton did it. Second strategic mistake. Uh, and so that's the second thing that the uh, West has to do, promote multilateral institutions. And the third suggestion I have, I'll just mention it because I'm running out of time. It's also the one that is the most shocking I bet none of you will guess what the third M word is. The third M word is Machiavellian. I know in the West, Machiavelli is regarded as an embodiment of evil. In fact, I quote the, one of the, uh, America's biggest political scientists, uh, Leo Strauss, as saying that M Machiavelli is an embodiment of evil. But if you go back and read a wonderful essay by Sir Isaiah Berlin, a British liberal philosopher who wrote a lengthy essay on Machiavelli in the New York Review of Books, you will find that uh, Isaiah Berlin explains that the goal of Machiavelli at the end of the day was to promote virtue. His goal was to try and achieve better outcomes at the end of the day. And I actually believe, and this is a subversive thought I'm leaving for you at the end, that in some ways, paradoxically, if the West became more Machiavellian, more calculating about where its real interests lay, then actually the West will be better off and the world will be better off. Thank you. Can I ask you a few questions? We might sit down sure, sure. Um, uh, to elaborate a little bit on uh, the many things you said. Um, and then we ask Professor Paul Schaeffer to uh, comment on the book and maybe even on what you, s you just said, because I saw him taking down notes, but mm. um, he is. Um, I think he's taking down too many notes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, just just um, uh, to elaborate a few points you're making, and I've I've been uh, reading your books and other books, your book and other books. Um, so just um, there are many things about what you write to like, and also the tone of voice you do it. You, you come as a very good friend um, and giving advice, and that's of course a very nice way and a diplomatic way. If you've, you've been a diplomat for a big part of your life. Um, in what way do you really like the West? Mm. Is it just a way of um, um, uh, uh, a way that you know that people will tend to listen better if you mm. make them compliments first, or mm. or are you really really <laughs> fed up by that? <laughs> you're, you're basically saying am I being Machiavellian? <laughs> no, I, I I would say that uh, uh, my admiration for the West is very genuine uh, because I mean, and, and and I say this quite honestly because. You know, uh, 
just to describe to you, I'm, I'm ethnically a Sindhi, you know. Uh, you know, Sindhis are a subgroup of Indians, you know, Sindhis. And if you look at, let's say, above my generation, right, my mother, my father, my uncles and aunties, uh, and they are, they are huge families, you know, they had, my, each, my mother and father had six, seven siblings. None of them went to university. No one in my family, none of my three sisters, went to university. None of my first cousins, older than me, went to university. So in this all generation, all generation, generation before, never went to university. I was the first one ever of all my relatives to enter a modern university, University of Singapore. And I studied philosophy, mainly Western philosophy. And it completely transformed me. It made me aware of how big the world is, you know. And, uh, and by the way, it doesn't mean that my first cousins failed. By the way, my first cousins are much richer than me. They went to business. They made lots of money. They consider me the man who failed. He went to government. Right? Who makes money in government? <laughs> right? And then, but then after me, all the, my children, all my nephews and nieces, and all the children of my first cousins have all gone to university. And who created, and this, this entrance into the university world opens your mind. I know this because I saw where my mind was before I went how my mind opened. And this is a gift from the West. And, and the fact, and one reason why the human condition is becoming so, improving so much, is because all these Western-style universities are producing graduates who understand science and technology and cause and effect, and then setting up clinics in remote villages and teaching mothers how to wash their hands to get rid of germs. And you know what's the result of that? Infant mortality in the last 30 years has gone shoo. This is, by the way, we have saved more babies in the last 30 years than in hundreds of years, you know. You want data, go to Stephen Pinker's book. So, I, I, so my admiration for the West is not faint, it's real. Which is why I'm actually, therefore, as a result of that, genuinely puzzled that the most successful civilization in human history no doubt about it, has lost its way in the last 30 years and lost its way very badly. That's why, as my friends say, this is a love letter to the West. Wake up. Yeah, yeah. I read it like that. You, you say it's a provocation, but it's, uh, actually it's much more of a love letter. It's much more um, how come that you've done so wonderful things and, you know, and, and stop doing them. Um, um, and then, then you say... Um, but there's, there's something which um, also puzzles me, because in a way you could say that, uh, like you pointed out in the beginning of your lecture as well, um, uh, the West succeeded. Uh, good governance sort of uh, went all over the world. Um, there's hardly any real poverty, and maybe mm. the last real poverty will be eliminated you know, over the next decade. or By 2030. By 2030. It's, it's probably, it might be really gone. So it's, it looks like it really succeeded. But you could also say that... Um, 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 and you say the really important thing in 2001 is not the World Trade Center, but it's uh, the entering, entering of China into the World Trade Organization. Mm. It's interesting that they're both the, sort of the same. The, well. It's interesting that yeah. World Trade is yeah. in both. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, you just noticed it. I didn't notice it myself. <laughs> and it's um, uh, uh, and. Um, and you could say that's sort of a real achievement also of the Western institutions to, to, to have them enter. But then you're saying um, Europe should um, also help establish um, a good governance in Northern Africa and uh, the Arab countries yeah. because that's where the re real danger for Europe lies. Yeah. And that's the real first uh, 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 task of, of, of European society. But isn't it, you could also argue that a lot of people in the West are arguing, arguing uh, it's about time we stop helping everybody in the world mm. and start thinking about ourselves, which yeah. sounds a bit Machiavellian, which you say mm. is mm. Supp supposed the West should do as well. So yeah. how should I look at that? Well, I think... Um, isn't it about time we stop you know, giving development aid? And yeah. I mean, how, how, how does that yeah. fit into your... Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm glad you mentioned North Africa because in my, my, one of my very first essays, which I wrote, uh, I think in 
1993, so 25 years ago, uh, was called The West and the Rest uh, in National Interest was published. And I pointed out, in 1993, eh, I said, Europe, watch out. Because if you don't do anything about North Africa, right? Very soon, the, the people in North Africa are going to discover that uh, Mediterranean is a small pond and the boats will come. So I spoke about this 25 years ago. Absolutely. And then the boats it's one, it's one and of the many boats incidents came. you predicted. And, but why, why, why did the boats come? It's interesting. Now, for a start, okay, whether or not you continue helping them or not help them is one question. But one thing you can do is not assume that by your intervention you'll make things better. And as you know, surprisingly, in the case of Libya, it was not America. Normally it's America that's the interventionist country. But UK and France decided to intervene in Libya. And the result was that the Libyans are worse off. No. And in many ways, the boats are now coming from Libya. So be very careful when you intervene in other societies. But there's also a more positive message that I give in this book and other books, which is that at the end, and this is a very important psychological point I'm going to make. Um, the North Africans cannot learn about development from Europeans. They cannot. Because culturally, you're very different. So how did the Asians succeed? Why, did, why were the Asians the first non-Western states to modernize? The reason is that Japan succeeded first. And when Japan succeeded, then the neighbors of Japan said, hey, if Japan can do it, maybe we can do it too. So the four tigers, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong, Singapore succeeded. Yeah. And the four, four tigers succeeded. Then the ASEAN states said, hey, we can also succeed. So Malaysia copied Singapore. Thailand. And then Thailand copied Singapore. And then the, and when we succeeded, Deng Xiaoping came to Southeast Asia and Deng Xiaoping said, hey, Southeast Asian states, vassal states of China, they can succeed. We can succeed too. And you know, the ripple effect of such. So if you want to create a ripple effect of development in North Africa, and I mean this quite sincerely, Find the best, the brightest young people from Tunisia, from Algeria, from Morocco. Send them to Southeast Asia to see why Indonesia is so successful. Indonesia was supposed to break apart and become the Yugoslavia of Southeast Asia in 1997-1998. Today, Indonesia is the most successful Islamic democracy. And Indonesia is doing so well that by 2050, it'll have the fifth largest economy in the world. Your former colony. Amazing. So, you, but they will learn, you see, it's, it's all about the psychology of development. So I have actually lived in what I call the pre-modern world as a child, progressed into the modern world, and then began to realize the opportunities. Mm -hmm. You just pointed it out very um, uh, eloquently the way the Chinese sort of bogged down the Americans at the beginning of the century in the Middle East, mm. in Iraq. Because the Chinese um, uh, kept their eyes on the ball and sort of on the long, on the long haul. And, um, but on the other hand, and, and you're saying, you're predicting, and you've been written, writing about it, that China will become the first power in the world, and that's very, very likely indeed. But you're saying... Oh, I, I also take bets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anybody wants to bet, I'll take a bet. <laughs> good, good bottles, of, fine bottles of red wine. Or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but, um, and you're, you're saying, but yes, but um, don't worry about that, because uh, the Chinese will behave. Mm. But if, you, if I listen to your example, I mean, they're cunning, they're Machiavellian. Mm. I mean, I mean, isn't that sort of a bit much to just think that it yeah. will all be well? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I'm so glad you asked that question because that's actually one of the points I didn't make to you all today is that I think that the next 10 years of human history are going to be among the 10 most important years in human history. 
And I, the reason why I'm writing this book now is that we have a small window of opportunity to shape how in China emerges as number one. And to put it very simply, if you work with China now, to set up a cooperative order that incorporates your interests and their interests, we will have a stable world. But if you provoke China now, then you're going to end up in a troubled world. And that's why Bill Clinton's advice is very apt. He's basically, I mean, he was being, actually the advice that Bill Clinton gave, as I say in the book, was very Machiavellian. What Bill Clinton was saying to his fellow Americans, if you read beneath the lines, what he's saying is, hey, guys, wake up. China is going to become number one. We're going to become number two. Now, how do we make sure that we put the handcuffs of multilateralism onto China? Simple, we put the handcuffs of multilateralism on ourselves first, as America. And then when China becomes number one, you take out the handcuffs and you put it on China. That's what he's suggesting. In a very Machiavellian way, that's what Bill Clinton was suggesting. Now, if there were, you know, what I find puzzling huh, is that America used to have big strategic thinkers. I'll give you some, like, three examples. Henry Kissinger, Sibigny Brzezinski, George Cannon. They're gone. You don't have any of the strategic thinkers. And you know what? As I say in the book, when the when United States began to push for the expansion of NATO, Kissinger advised against it, Brzezinski advised against it, George Cannon advised against it. So that means So therefore how you treat China is very important now. But that means so the, to answer your question is what you do to China will determine what China will do to you. And um, given the fact that there might not be too much strategic insight inside the Pentagon or the Foreign, or the foreign Office, uh, the, 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 um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, that bites a lot of bad weather, a lot of trouble. No, no, unless no. they read my book. Unless they read your book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, they read my book, the world will be a better place. But the, <laughs> I find that, that's but, a half serious, half joking no, point. No, no, no. You're, uh, I understand. But and, and if you look at, but then again, if you look at, um, because you're saying the ways of the West are, are um, the interference of the West with a lot of the world wasn't wasn't good at all. But the way they they brought good governance and the, the, the reason, reason reason to the world, um, the Enlightenment. Um, part of that, a real important part of that of the success probably is democracy. Mm -hmm. Good. And in the book, you're saying, yes, um, uh, uh, the Western democratic thinkers have pointed out that it's um, uh, 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 not such a good system, but better than all the alternatives. And that's a sort of a literal quotation yeah. from... But how do you look upon democracy? Because you, you, mm. you don't really mention that sort of the core yeah. value of what West has brought. Mm. I mean, you're saying it's important, but on the other hand, you're pointing out that you mm. can have uh, a good governance without democracy. How do you... So how mm. should we go about with a man like yeah. Xi Jinping who, yeah. who gives himself eternal yeah. power? Yeah. Is that how... Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you raised the democracy question, but as you know, it's a very complicated question. It is. Yeah. It's, not some, it's not a question you can give very simple answers to, but let me just make a few quick points. One, I believe in democracy. I would like to live in a democratic society rather than an undemocratic society. And I actually believe that eventually all societies will become democratic. Uh, although eventually, I don't know when it's going to be, especially China will be the big exception. Uh, because China clearly has succeeded without becoming a democracy. Although, as I emphasized earlier, the government still considers itself accountable to the people, even though it is not a democracy. Uh, the second point is about, uh, and the second point is that uh, democracy actually has spread to the third world. And as I mentioned, the world's largest democracy is India. The third largest democracy is Indonesia. So democracy is also flourishing and succeeding in the third world too. It's not just undemocratic societies are flourishing. And the third point about uh, China, actually the Chinese uh, government learned a major lesson from the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Communist Party, 
and they saw what happened to the Russian people. You know, the Russian economy imploded. Life expectancy of the Russians came down. Infant mortality of the Russians went up. And they said, hey, that can happen to us too. So the, the Chinese will not make an immediate transition to a democracy uh, under the present government. But at the same time, I also say this, in some ways, the Chinese Communist Party is doing the world and the West a favor by remaining in power. Because if you had a democratic government in China today, at a time when Chinese pride is rising and going up through the roof, a democratically elected Chinese government will be far more nationalist than Donald Trump, far more assertive than Donald Trump. And he will actually become a far more difficult country to deal with. So the Chinese Communist Party is actually delivering a global public good by bottling up Chinese nationalism. That's a very interesting point, yeah. If you say bottling up, you know, um, then, then it becomes sort of ominous in a way because things you bottle up tend to... True. Which is, which, is why, which is why, if you look carefully at the record of the Chinese Communist Party, you know, and this, this, this will be the subject of a different book, it's actually be proved to be very adept at managing China. I'll give you one simple thing. The conventional wisdom 20 years ago about China's economic development was that China can keep growing in the first phase of development because all it has to do is to copy from the rest of the world. But China will not succeed in the second phase of development because second phase of development requires innovation, creativity. Now, if you have a communist government, you cannot have creativity and innovation. I don't know how many of you have been to China recently. If you really want to meet, get, uh, encounter some of the most innovative industries today, go to China. When you carry, in China, if you carry cash, they think you're a dinosaur. Nobody carries cash. Everybody pays for everything. And I'm not exaggerating. Your smartphone does everything for you. Everything. And you can press your smartphone, and within one hour, a hot boiled egg appears for breakfast at your doorstep. The smartphone, you want, you want mobile payments, you want uh, e-mobile bikes, and also, in some of the leading areas of science and technology, the Chinese have broken through. So what happened? How is it that the theory says, in a Communist Party, you cannot have creative, creative and innovation. In practice, you do. Now, that takes a certain amount of skill, you know, and ability. And so I always say, yes, all you detractors may be right. China may collapse and fail. Of course, it can happen. Anything can happen. But if you're a betting man, I say, watch out. If the Chinese succeed, be careful. And you're saying, um, rightfully, I would say, um, that Machiavelli is largely misunderstood in the West as mm. you know, being an evil philosopher on public policy and pol on politics. I believe you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, actually, the first poem I ever wrote, I ever got published when I was 18, was a sonnet on Machiavelli, uh, praising Machiavelli. Oh, can you, can you send me a copy? I, 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 it's in <laughs> Dutch, but, it's, <laughs> but I will. It's a sonnet on Machiavelli and how I really like him. But um, because he does um, um, uh, look for a better world in which citizens have more virtue to, yeah. to be able virtue, to... Virtue, V-I-R-T-U. Yeah, but in, yeah, in, in Italy, it's virtu. No? Yeah, um, so, but it's, um, so I do actually think that you have a very good point. On the other hand, what would the West, if it becomes more Machiavellian, I mean, we, if you look at colonialism, that's been quite Machiavellian for a while. So, um, should, in what way would you say we would, should have, or we should become more um, um, yeah. looking you, after yeah. our own interests? Yeah, I, I, my book is up there, but if, you, if any of you get the book, look at the last few pages. There's a paragraph in the, which begins by something like you're saying that, I'm certain that my friends in Africa, Asia, 
and Latin America will be troubled by my call on the West to be more Machiavellian. So let me explain to them why I believe it's better for the West to become more Machiavellian. Because if the West becomes more Machiavellian and realizes where its real interests lie, it will intervene less in the rest of the world. So it's actually good for the rest of the world. And, and at the end of the day, you know, I believe that a strong and successful America is good for the world. So if an America loses its way and elects Trump, it's very bad for the world. But if America is in a good mood, confident, happy, successful, it's good for the world. I actually want to see a strong America. I don't want to see a weak America. So all my advice is, that, and then I, one other statistic I have in the book, which is quite remarkable, the United States, as you know, spends more on defense than any other country in the world, much, 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 much more. I don't know, quite know why, because it's the safest country in the world. They only got to fight against Canada and Mexico. You only, you only need one battalion on each side, your job is done. You don't need 11 aircraft carriers to fight Canada and Mexico. Whereas China has got to fight with Japan, Russia, India, and so on and so forth. Big difference, right? And in a country that is building 11 aircraft carriers, right? I think if I, the statistic in my book, if it's correct, is that two-thirds of American families do not have emergency cash, cash of $500 to spend. Two-thirds. This is the world's richest country. So clearly, if America did more to help its people, it did more to help the, the bottom 10, 20, 30 percent and create a happier society, a happier America is good for the world. And that's what you call Machiavellian, not, right. and less intervening, less hubris, that's more right. more looking after its own interest in that that's respect. Right. Yes, um, thank you for elaborating that last point. Um, a wonderful speaking to you. I could have, I, I, I could be asking, you know, 10, 20 other uh, other questions. Thank you for uh, sharing it with. We asked Professor Paul Scheffer, um, public, um, one of our mo main uh, public intellectuals, I would say, um, writing on um, Europe, on the borders of Europe, on the world for decades already in the Netherlands and inter internationally. Professor at Tilburg University, um, also being involved in a long long study on, chi on the way China, India and Brazil looking at um, uh, Europe. Okay. And we ask you to, to comment on the, on the, the, books, on the book or books and um, on maybe what you've heard. Thank you for coming, Paul. Yeah, Sefer. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor and a real pleasure um, to engage in this conversation. Um, if thank only thank you for bringing all my books. Yeah, if, if only I just brought them just to emphasize that I've been teaching my students over the last seven years um, with the help of your books. So um, I've been reading them, rereading them. Um, and I could say that um, trying to understand the world with the rise of China, India, Brazil, how it affects Europe. It has been a great um, a challenge, what you write, a great source of inspiration. And um, I would like to read to you, because I think you fulfill the program of a famous British historian, Arnold Toynbee, who wrote in 1948 already the following words. The paradox of our generation is that all the world has now profited by an education which the West has provided, except the West herself. The West today, 1948, is still looking at history from the old parochial self-centered standpoint which the other living societies have been by now been compelled to transcend. And he went on to say that sooner or later the West in her turn is bound to receive the re-education which the other civilizations have already obtained. So I think you're providing <coughs> exactly this re-education by confronting uh, Western societies, America, Europe, with the perspective um, of other parts of the world. And uh, I think it's basically, I think there cannot be any meaningful discussion about your basic uh, assumption. That is to say that the last 200 years have been in terms of world history an aberration. That is to say the over-representation of a small part 
of the world's demography, world's population in the world's economy is historically seen an aberration and it will come to an end. No, even if China will flounder, even if Indonesia will not become the fifth mm. largest and by 250, mm. because who knows what will be the world at that time, still the underlying basic shift that we are already seeing from the last 30, 40 years will uh, continue. So I think there cannot be any meaningful contradiction when also Henry Kissinger was uh, describing China not as an emerging power, but as a returning power. And I think that's true for India and for other uh, countries as well. It's basically also a hopeful message you have because the world is becoming a more equal place with all the uncertainties perhaps that provides for Western societies having learned to look at the world in a very Eurocentric or Western-centric perspective, but it's a hopeful message because it entails the rise of so many countries and also the alleviation of so many people from poverty. So I think there we basically agree, and I think uh, what you've been writing in the last 15 years about this um, is hard to challenge. So I have four critical observations based on, um, on what I've just said. The first one is that you um, assume that this basic shift is not being perceived in the West, that we are somehow oblivious to what is happening in the world. When I read the European integration and the history of European integration, I would say that already um, in 1973, the Declaration of Copenhagen acknowledges the major shift that is going on in the world and says Europe has to speak with one voice or it will fail. So the whole single market in the mid-90s was just one big response to the rise of Japan. Japan is somehow absent in your recent book, not in the previous ones, but it's not very often uh, quoted. But I can still remember very vividly that in the 1980s, the rise of Japan and the whole idea of Japan is about to overtake the United States was a major source of inspiration for European integration. So we cannot understand the underlying dynamic of European integration without this wider context. And simply claiming that this shift has been uh, somehow not observed by Western elites is, I think, bordering on an overstatement. To go one step further, I think we cannot understand European integration without the context of decolonization. We have always told the narrative about Euro Europe after the Second World War as European integration is the answer to war returning in Europe. It's basically the reflection on the horrible catastrophe of Second World War. But European integration would have not been possible without decolonization. If France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Italy would have remained colonial powers, they would have never discovered each other as neighbors on the European continent. So European decolonization, the decolonization of Europe was in a very fundamental way the precondition of European integration. So I think this whole power shift that is going on in the world was fundamental to understanding why European integration is going on for 60 years, because it's not only a moral tale based on uh, the Second World War, but it's also a tale more Machiavellian, if you want, mm. about how to unite to remain a relevant voice in a world that is changing beyond recognition. My second critical observation uh, would be that while we could agree easily on economic convergence that is going on, that is to say mm. the relative rise of China, India and others, the relative decline of Europe and America, the question is, and there I find more ambiguity in your uh, writing, whether you also think there is a cultural convergence going on. Let me confront you with two brief quotes from your own work. On the one hand, you stress that there is a process of de-Westernization. You write, the mindsets of the largest populations within Asia, the Chinese, the Muslims and the Indians, have been changed irrevocably where once they may have been borrowing Western cultural perspectives, now their perceptions are growing further and further apart. So here we have divergence. 
Then at the same time you write, and basically that was the lesson of today as well, you say Asian so societies are not succeeding because of a rediscovery of some hidden or forgotten strength of Asian civilizations. Instead, they are rising now because they have finally discovered the pillars of Western wisdom. And you say we are witnessing a convergence on a certain set of norms and on how to create better societies. So my question would be, and it's really an open question, because I think this is one of the most fundamental questions to ask about our world, whether beyond economic convergence, we see cultural, civilizational convergence, or is it, the earlier quote, that we're drifting further and further apart? To me, that seems one of the great questions of our time, because if we're really growing further and further apart, then the world is not becoming a more peaceful place. Hmm. The third uh, critical observation would be you have a um, council to Europe saying basically our strategic, first strategic question that we uh, confront is a spillover of internal conflict, you quoted interstate uh, conflict with Pinker, but of course the death resulting from intra-state conflict are enormous. Half a million people died in the Syrian civil war. So there is a real turmoil surrounding Europe, and you rightly say Europe doesn't, have, doesn't need a global perspective to begin with. Its first strategic priority should be what is going on in Northern Africa, the Middle East, and I would add also the forms of disintegration uh, of some of the republics of the former Soviet Union. At the same time, you say the American interest is elsewhere, it's China. So basically, your counsel to America and Europe are very different. You say America should disengage from this direct neighborhood of Europe, so to say, from the Middle East, from Northern Africa. It's not a strategic priority. Europe should engage more in a peaceful way, in an economic way, etc. But basically, you say there's no common interest anymore of the West. The West should fall apart. But if this is true, and if the world that is in front of us is a world that could be described as multipolar, which is basically when I go to China, is basically what people tell me. We want a European Union that is strong, that is one of the poles in a multipolar world, and that is basically looking after its own neighborhood. The Americans should do that, China should do that, India should do that, Brazil should do that, South Africa should do that, etc. But if the world is really a world of China first, of India first, of Russia first, of America first, of Europe first, regional powers, basically from a perspective of self-interest, not engaging too far beyond their own reach, mm. isn't that also a world where nationalism would be thriving, where Trump is indeed not an aberration, but fits in a logic that is also at work in Russia, Russian nationalism, is at work in China, I'm not that confident about the bottling up of Chinese nationalism, to be um, honest. But isn't Trump in that way fitting into an overall logic of a multipolar world when he says we're not going to engage in Syria too much? And are we not seeing in Syria what the world will be after the Pax Americana, which I do agree with you, is obsolete? But the, the, the void will be filled, and it is filled, by Turkey, by Iran, by Russia, by others, and that produces a civil war that's gone on for seven years. So where is the multilateralism beyond these perspectives of regional powers looking after our own interests and being minimalist in a way? But what is the world then uh, in that view? My last critical remark would be this. Um, we have been talking about uh, Japan for a long time, in the 80s, in the 90s, I refer to that with a perspective of economic convergence. Now you say what has happened the last 30 years, you project that into 2050. I think we should be a little mere, a bit more humble, in a way, um, because you rightly say that who could have imagined the world as it is today, 30 years ago? And I would add, who will be able to imagine now from where we are now, the world, how it will be in 30 years' time. I think we should be a little bit more humble in these projections of shares of GDP to 
250, because I've seen the projections about Japan in the 80s. I've seen similar projections about the Soviet Union in the 1950s. We're living basically the third version of a convergence theory, economically speaking. The two others failed, in a way. So a little bit more um, uncertainty there would be welcome. And I would say I started my uh, research with your books, very much with the idea of a decline of the West. And after visiting China, India, Brazil, talking to many, many people several times, I was confronted with a very self-critical analysis in those countries saying, you haven't got the faintest idea how vulnerable we are, how much internal contradictions we are living. Don't think that the past performance gives you any guarantee about our future performance. We will stumble into unforeseen contradictions. And I can say that my reading of what's going on in China, the centralization of power that's going on in China, betrays a sense of vulnerability. It's not a sign of strength to accumulate so much power into one person. It's a sign, this, this overall sense of vulnerability, of weakness, in the Chinese Communist Party, leading to a sense of control that is growing, growing, also in the universities. People I met five years ago are now much more afraid to speak out openly than five years ago. So how do you look at those vulnerabilities in China? And the mirror of that is, I think I concluded my research after five years with better understanding the hidden vitality of European societies in terms of their universities, in terms of their urban culture, in terms of a culture of relative equality, relative stable uh, states in terms of um, uh, justice, not that high forms of corruption that you can see, in, for example, in Brazil, and some other examples. So there is a hidden strength in European societies that we shouldn't underestimate. That is why I think the love letter is sent to a good address because it will be heard. I think it has been heard already, at least in Tilburg at the university. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paul Schreffer, for um, observations and questions and compliments and remarks. Um, uh, four, in fact. Um, probably we start off with one or two and then... Sure, sure. No, I, I, I took notes, you know, because I... I, 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 uh, yeah. I, I, I thought these, these were... Is it... Should I respond? Yeah, please, yeah. Please, uh, please. I must say, these are excellent uh, observations and very helpful. I'm truly grateful to you, you know, for, for making them because it's, you always learn more from uh, criticisms, you know, uh, especially, you know, constructive criticisms like the one that you're uh, offering. And I, 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 I would say I agree with some of your points and, and maybe not with others. So, um, but you're right about the, the European Union project, the first point. Uh, it is, I mean, it was a result of the rise of Japan, but it was also an effort, as you know, to counterbalance the United States also, uh, because uh, the Euro project really yeah was you didn't want to rely completely on the US dollar, yeah. and so you wanted to have your own. So, and, and I, I, by the way, I should emphasize, I'm, I'm one of the greatest lovers of the European Union, you know. Uh, I actually think that the European Union has achieved what I call the ultimate pinnacle uh, of civilizational achievement. And what is this ultimate pinnacle? Huh? Uh, and this is where I wrote a book on ASEAN last year. And in the book on ASEAN, I say that uh, in Europe, you have zero wars. In ASEAN, you have zero wars. We don't fight each other also. But in the European Union, you have gone to a much higher level. You have zero prospect of war. Right? What happened? You touched your microphone. I oh, think it's a okay. jacket. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. my jacket, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't turn so much. Uh, so, um, the... In ASEAN, we don't have zero prospect of war yet. So we want to, our dream is to replicate what the European Union has achieved. And I actually think, I think a larger East Asia, let's say if you can achieve zero prospect of war within China and Japan, within China and India, that would be a fantastic thing. 
So this is something that we can still continue to learn mm. uh, uh, from the European Union. So that's why I also think that we need a strong uh, 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 European Union. And, um, uh, and, and therefore, I'm actually quite puzzled by the pessimism in Europe. Mm. Because, you know, I mean, frankly, if you look at the quality of life of the European citizens, it is far better than the quality of life of citizens anywhere. Even in the United States of America, the inequality in the United States is far greater. I mean, if you ask me what's a model society for the world, what I would like to see, let's say, in Singapore, would be something like Sweden or Denmark or, you know, uh, that, that's the kind of society that we want to replicate in the rest of the world. So what you have done is, yes, uh, it is, it is uh, positive uh, for the world. So please cheer up <laughs> and look happy. <laughs> uh, number two, on convergence, uh, economic, you, you, you put your finger on a very critical point. And here I would say that you have to slice, when you talk of convergence, you have to slice three different dimensions. On the economic side, there'll be a convergence. Mm. On the cultural side, there could be a divergence. Mm. But on the geopolitical side, it depends on the decisions you make. And to give you an example of how uh, uh, the geopolitics can go either way, uh, as you know, India has been very successful. India, Indian economy is doing very well. And what's interesting is that as India is doing better and better, you would assume that India would become to look more and more Western. But suddenly, for the first time in India's history, you know, most Indian prime ministers used to wear, like me, a jacket and tie. Man Mohan Singh used to go out in jacket and tie. But now we have a prime minister of India who doesn't want to wear the jacket and tie. He wants to wear Indian clothes. He went to Davos. Uh, Victor, you were there. He doesn't speak in English. He speaks in Hindi. That's cultural divergence. But at the same time, Modi is geopolitically the most pro-Western prime minister India has had. Because he's afraid of China. Uh, not, not just because of that. I, I, I think there are other Partly. reasons also. Yeah. Uh, it, it's also a way of leveraging uh, uh, Indian power. It's, mm. a, it's a shrewd yeah. calculation. But I mean, it doesn't mean he completely agrees with the West, because on Iran, he disagrees with your policies, for example. You know? uh, American policies on Iran, he disagrees. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a cultural divergence in that. But in the case, the, the critical, critical point you made is about the European Union and USA. Should you go apart or stay together? But let me give you one example. You, so far, you've only talked about North Africa. But I can tell you, Europe's long-term challenge can be captured in one demographic statistic, OK? In 1950, Europe's population was twice that of Africa's, 400 million, 200 million. Today, Africa's population is more than twice that of Europe. By 2100, Africa's population is going to be 10 times that of Europe. So clearly, if Africa doesn't develop, then Europe is going to have a big problem. Huge. You'll have 4 billion people south of you. So what is Europe's long-term strategic interest to develop Africa? What do you want to see in Africa? You want to see more roads, more bridges, more ports, more infrastructure? And guess who can be your partner to build infrastructure in Africa? China. China. Yep. So why don't you then work with China to develop infrastructure in Africa that retains Africans in, in Africa and exports less Africans outside? But then if you do that, the United States will say, excuse me a second, whose side are you on? So that's why, that's the, that's the question, whose side are you on? Are you on your own side? Are you going to protect your long-term geopolitical interests in Africa? Or are you then going to become subservient to America and say, no, no, I'll join you in isolating China. It doesn't matter if I suffer. That's what I mean mm. about calculating your own interests. And it doesn't have to be, and this is a very critical point I make also in the book, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. Because America's growth, sorry, China's growth can also be good for America. In fact, one of the, when I had lunch with Henry Kissinger a few weeks ago, uh, don't, don't quote this piece, 
Um, I, I, think he, he, I think he said this publicly, but I'm not absolutely sure. I will write it down immediately. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, but, you know, I tell you, he said, you know, as you know, when, when, when China is a fact, China, when China created the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Obama administration mm. opposed it. He made phone calls to uh. everywhere saying, don't join. I'm sure Den Haag got a phone call, don't join. But Henry Kissinger said, that was a mistake. United States should have joined the EIB. And I agree with him. Mm. Because an, Amer an American, an EIB with an America inside would have much higher standards of good governance. So it is not a zero sum game. So you, therefore, you've got to do these calculations in a much more sophisticated and nuanced way than it's been done. But as you know, that's not the case often in, 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 in European policy. Then if you want a very quick one-liner on your last point about projections, you're absolutely right. The projections can go completely wrong. China can collapse in the next 10 years, and China can become like Japan. But let me emphasize one very critical point here, okay? Everybody keeps saying, you look at Japan, didn't make it. So China may also not make it. But Japan's population is, what, 130 million. China's population is 1.3 billion, 10 times larger. All that the Chinese have to do is achieve 25% of the per capita income of Americans. Then China will have a bigger economy. And if you assume the Chinese are one quarter as smart, or one half as smart as the average American, they'll also succeed. And, but let me just add one very important point about China. China has its own cycles of going up and down. And when the down cycle comes, they go down for one or two hundred years. You can go back and check. But when the up cycle comes, they're up for three hundred years. So the Chinese cycle, mm. so what you have seen so far, in my view, is the beginning 40 years of a 300-year up cycle. I'll, I won't be around to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to take bets. I, I'll be around. And you won't be around either. <laughs> But uh, perhaps one, uh, there is of course so many things to say now, but um, let me ask you one thing. You are describing the relative decline of the West, which is in itself something that is basically the outcome of a much larger rise of others. So that is, um, I think, beyond dispute. But you somehow seem to have still great expectations about Western responses to this change affecting the world. For example, you're right, when the West wouldn't have humiliated Russia, Putin would, have, would not have happened. Mm. I think Putin was first of all a reaction to the disintegration mm. of the Soviet Union and the, 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 the ruinous mm. uh, governance mm. in the Yeltsin period. If you looked at Petersburg at that time, there was m m mafia all over the place. So first of all, it was an internal dynamic in Russia that produced in perhaps uh, a majority wanting strong leadership. Not so much, and it didn't, I mean, the, the answers were to be criticized. I do agree. There was a too hasty um, expansion of NATO, etc. But to think that that was a determining factor mm. for Putin's rise, I think it's overestimating our role. The same is true for Africa. That is, of course, that should be some worry. If we could be the decisive factor, we can certainly contribute. Mm. But if I look at Egypt, the population of Egypt now Half of it is under 24, better educated than ever, with less prospects than ever. We can help to build infrastructure, uh, contribute to universities, etc. But the turmoil in Egypt, first of all, starting with the demography, secondly, with the effects of climate change on this very vulnerable delta and its people living there, the, the religious strife, the authoritarian solutions, etc. The West can help but I doubt whether it can really make a difference, the difference in Egypt. 
In the end, it should be Egypt itself, Egypt civil society, its leadership, etc., coming up with solutions. And that is, and you have in many ways, you have still great expectations mm. about the Western possibilities, where I would say the lesson of this relative decline is indeed less interference, more reliance upon civil society elites in those societies. But this is a long, long work in progress, perhaps. I hope it's in progress, but it's a long-term perspective. And the short-term outcome of the turmoil that surrounds us is, of course, migration, our refugee movements that Europe has to come to uh, an understanding with, you know, has to accommodate to some extent, has to confront in a way. But um, So aren't you somewhat over-optimistic about the role of the West mm. still? Well, I, I wouldn't say I'm over-optimistic, but I, but I do think there's one thing you, you have to be aware of. At the end of the day, the European Union is still, uh, if you combine European Union, either the largest or second largest economic uh -huh. power in the world. As you know, it varies within the uh -huh. US and EU. Um, and so given your size, your economic decisions have ripple effects. So I'll give you an example which I mentioned in mm. my essay 25 years ago in with the West and the rest. You had a common agricultural policy. And as a result, the common agricultural policy, you subsidize your agricultural products. And given your size, some of the products went to Africa and undermined African agriculture. When you undermine African agriculture, you create unemployed African farmers then the unemployed African farmers start walking north. So is it wiser for you to not subsidize mm. your agriculture or, or at least make sure that whatever you do inside Europe doesn't create unemployment in Africa because you will suffer the consequences. Uh. And as you know, the Africans protested, but the Africans were weak, you were strong, you ignored their protests. That's why it's very unwise. Mm. So think, in, in a, in a, I must, see, we live in a small, interdependent global village. Given the size of the European Union, your internal decisions have external consequences. So think about the external consequences mm. of your internal actions, and then ask yourself, will this have a positive long-term impact on my security? or a negative long-term impact on my security. That's all I have to say. No. no, I mean, we could agree upon that easily. No, no, but um, I doubt and that still is my main worry. If I look at um, Northern Africa now, or the Middle East, who's going to make the critical difference? And are these societies, I mean, the Arab Spring, to give that example, Mm. was, of course, a sign that all those who thought there was mm. not a democratic ambition in the Arab world were mm. proven that they wrong. Mm. There is a democratic ambition. There is an ambition of civil society in those countries. Mm. Absolutely. The question is, why doesn't it lead to more stable solutions and mm. outcomes produced by these societies? How do you read that, the turmoil, mm. apart from Western intervention? Because that is, of course, mm. part of the explanation, yeah. but not the explanation overall. Yeah. yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to say something very politically incorrect, okay? Incorrect, okay. Uh, because, uh, you know, sometimes you've got to say things that, you know, should not be said in, in polite conversation, but have to be said if you want to understand the world. And I've actually told this to my Arab friends, okay? I said the biggest psychological mistake that the Arabs have done is to keep thinking that their future lies in, time, in copying or replicating the European experience. Actually, if they try to learn from Europe, they will fail. But if they try to learn from Asia, they will succeed. But unfortunately, the Arabs, for some strange reason, have become colonized mentally much more deeply, you know. And I know, we, I, I was personally colonized as a child. As a child growing up, 
in a British colony, I thought I as an Asian and an Indian was psychologically inferior to the British. You know, the British were upper class and I was underclass. In my lifetime, I've seen the psychological confidence of Asians go up to be on par with Europeans. And now quite dangerously, many Asians think they're superior. And I'm not exaggerating, by the way. So you can imagine the psychological revolution. So today, the, you know, you, you, you tell an Asian, right, to match the top brains in Harvard or, or Caltech, they can do it. In fact, if you look at the, when, when you have a race-blind admissions policy in any leading educational institution, the Asians will come in. So this has given the Asians incredible amount of psychological confidence. You have the same policy, the Arabs go down. Why? Because they haven't learned from Asia. That you've got to learn to take care of yourself and succeed. Don't look anywhere else. And that's why I told you, I told you my, one of my first suggestions, mm. send the Tunisians, send the Algerians, send the Moroccans, send the Egyptians to Asia. But they themselves, the Arabs, don't understand this. And I can tell you, the Gulf, in the Gulf countries, one big problem, and let's say if you go to, let's say if you go to Dubai, mm -hmm. the only South Asians they encounter are the ones doing the construction work, the cleaning work, and they think, we Arabs are here, South Asians are here. Excuse me. The South Asians are running Microsoft. The South Asians are running Google. The South Asians are running PepsiCo. The South Asians are the dean of the Harvard Business School. Where are you Arabs? So you can need a big change. And what is the answer then when you... Oh, the answer then is they, they, the Arabs need a fundamental psychological revolution. I've been through that psychological mm -hmm. revolution. They haven't. And so for them, that's, that's why I see I'm... Uh, uh, the, until the Arabs come to the realization that they have to learn from Asia, they won't change. So they might not change? Well, you never know. Or they might. Like, I mean, no one, no one predicted, huh, by the way, how fast China and India will grow. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much both for uh, exchanging uh, uh, ideas and taking notes from each other, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is always a wonderful thing to say. That's actually one of the nicest things, I think, of both of you, um, that you take texts, books, and ideas so very seriously. And I think we cannot stress that enough, how serious they are. Like just ma making a big compliment in a way to Fukuyama, that he, that he in a way poisoned <laughs> the Western no. mind or brain damage to it. That's, that's a very nice way of, of taking texts and intellectuals very seriously. We've been trying to do this uh, this afternoon as well. There might be somebody who like to ask or add or say or comment something to what's been said or ask a question to one of the professors uh, around. Yes, please. China, in the South Chinese Sea. Um, don't you think that you're uh, picturing a very optimistic picture of uh, making an op optimistic picture of China? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because they're pretty ag aggressive against the other uh, countries. Mm. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, China is not a perfect country. Uh, now is China an angelic country. China is a normal country. And all normal countries, when they become powerful, become more assertive. So China has become far more assertive. But I wrote a column for the Financial Times saying, there's a big difference between two English words. Assertive, aggressive. China has become assertive, but it hasn't become aggressive. You know, in the South China Sea, they're, they don't, it, they're not islands, they're reefs and rocks, okay? There are 30 or 40 of them, you know. 
uh, Philippines has nine or ten, Malaysia has got eight, Vietnam has got twelve, China has got eight, and so whatever, right? If China wants to, tomorrow, within 24 hours, it can sweep all of them. There's nothing that Vietnam or Malaysia can do. But take bets with you. China won't do it. But, but, but if you visit India, for example, yeah. and I've been talking to some people in the Indian Army, for example, they are really obsessed with okay. China's rise. Yeah. And they are definitely of the conviction yeah. that the chance that it will remain peaceful yeah. from an Indian perspective, and of course there has been yeah. a war between China and India in 62, they are mobilizing yeah. now in the border areas because mm. they're not confident that yeah. China's assertions mm. will not spill over into something mm. less benign. Yeah. How do you see yeah. that? Let me, let me just finish South China Sea. And then, because no. uh, there are two different dynamics here. Uh, on, on the South China Sea, uh, if you notice, by the way, that recently South China Sea has not appeared in the newspapers recently. That there was a, there was a spate in which the Chinese became more assertive. And then I wrote several articles pointing out the mistakes that China had made in the South China Sea. And to my absolute surprise, I was invited to Beijing to talk about mistakes that China had made in South China Sea. And I always say I've never been invited to America to talk about mistakes that America has made <laughs> in its foreign policy. So the Chinese have a capacity to learn. But there is no doubt that when China becomes a great power, the greater it becomes, the more assertive it will become. That you've got to take for granted. All great powers are like that. The only question is how do you try to maintain some checks on them. Now, India is a completely different issue. And you're absolutely right. I was in India in January this year, two months ago, to launch my ASEAN, Indian edition of my ASEAN no. book. And um, I was shocked uh, by the level of paranoia about China. You captured it very well. It's there. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a bit unhealthy and it's quite dangerous because it's actually very bad for uh, Asia if the two largest economic powers start squabbling with each other so early on uh, in their development. Uh, but at the same time, uh, again, I can take a bet with any of you, let's say 12 months, we have economic longer, there'll be no war within China and India in the next 12 months. I can take a bet with you, no problem. Because the, you know that that border uh, no shots have been fired for over 50 years now. That's amazing. That's one of the most difficult and tense borders. Huh? Mm. No because shots there have fired. been territorial incursions. There, no, no, there, there, there have been. Yes, yes. There are, all, there are all kinds of incidents. Exactly. But they've learned to manage it. Mm. And I can tell you that if you talk to the really thoughtful Indian strategic planners, they know that it would be an absolute mistake for India to be caught in a negative dynamic with mm. China. And, and I, I, there was one article where I wrote, is that I said the next, the next great power triangle will be between China, India, and America. And the best place for India to be is in the middle between China and America. So then you have the leverage to play. Just as America used this middle position between Soviet Union and China. India can do the same also. So that, that is something that some of the Indian strategic planners uh, are moving towards. But uh, I also want to add that what's unusual about the China-India relationship today is that on the one hand, there is greater paranoia at the border, but the relations between Xi Jinping and Modi are very good. Hi. Um, I've read your uh, 2008 book, uh, The New Asian Hemisphere, and uh, since then you've published Can Asians Think and uh, this love, uh, love letter to the, to the West. And what I'm thinking is how many more books uh, are you planning to write on, on the same <laughs> subject? Is there any learning curve here? I mean, this isn't your first time in Holland. Um, do you see a learning curve? Uh, is that a steep one? Yeah. Uh, very good question. I should mention that Can Nations Thing was actually published in 1998 and 20 years ago. 
uh, before the new Asian Hemisphere. In fact, I told Hank, my publisher, that I'll be launching the 20th anniversary edition of the book in Singapore in, uh, next month, uh, in May. Uh, you're right, I mean, but there, 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 there has been a consistent theme in, in, in my writings, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately so far, my predictions, have, oh, most of them have come true <laughs> in terms of anticipating Asia's rise and how it's going to change the world and, and how learning from the West has helped Asia and so on and so forth. But the next book I hope to write this year, in my, I'm on a nine-month sabbatical now, is to write a book on the relationship between the world's number one power which today is America, and the world's number one emerging power, China. Uh, so that's the relationship that is going to define the geopolitics of the world for the next two or three decades. So that will be my uh, next book. <laughs> so I hope to come back here to also launch it. <laughs> Um, you see now within the European Union and within a lot of European countries that there's a lot of concern about Chinese investments in Europe, yeah. especially when uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises take over technology companies or even when private Chinese companies mm. take over technology companies. Mm. And some say we should protect those companies and we shouldn't have those sold to Chinese, the Chinese, um, whereas others say we should continue to well, uphold these values of open mm. trade and open investment. Um, how do you look at these investments from China? Well, I, 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 I think it's, number one, all countries uh, should protect their national security. We should. I mean, Singapore should protect national security. You should protect your national security. And if you think an investment is going to undermine your national security, you should say no to that investment, clearly. But at the same time, you uh, also want to make sure that there is some kind of predictability in the process. And to create predictability in the process, it's important to create multilateral rules on investment. And, you know, this is where multilateralism, remember my second M word, multilateralism, it's very important you create one set of rules. And if you can create one set of rules and you apply them to all companies equally, then it can work. So I actually believe the multilateralization of the process is a, is a, is a, good, is a good way of managing uh, these kinds of investments. But you know, when you say that, uh, uh, talk of national security, uh, and I think to some extent the European Union also has experienced this, uh, when you give your data to a company like Facebook and Google, I guarantee you one thing, uh, the National Security Agency of the United States gets that data. Let's be very clear about this. The best intelligence collection operation, operation in the world is not the Chinese, it's not the Russian, it's America is number one and way ahead. So then the question is, how do you create rules to ensure that this doesn't happen? So create one set of rules to apply to all. And here I must say, uh, if there's one country in the world that can actually lead in terms of regulation in this area especially, it's not China, because in China the regulatory agencies are controlled by the government. It's not America, because in America the regulatory industries are captured by the industry. So in, only in Europe you have regulatory uh, uh, um, the regulatory processes that are not captured either by the government or the private sector. You have the independent regulatory agencies. So Europe, European standards should then become the gold standard for the world. And, and I hope you achieve consensus in Europe in these areas. I think there's a last question probably over the lady in the white. Um, Sophie here in, in the second row. Thank you. <coughs> China is building a new Silk Road. Mm. Uh, what would you think uh, the effect uh, in the long term would be for, for Europe, for instance, or mm. for Asia itself? Uh, well, I would say that the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, in economic terms, will be positive for the region. And indeed, uh, if you leave aside Japan, because, and, and Japan and India, 
both of whom are, as you know, quite wary of China and therefore not participating in the BRI. In the case of India, it's for a technical reason, because the China-Pakistan economic corridor goes through Indian, Pakistan occupied Kashmir. And so that's the reason. So India and Japan are not participating. But if you look at the rest of Asia, virtually all the countries are participating in the BRI initiative. And even Singapore, which has been very careful in this area, uh, two-thirds of the incoming BRI, it's called Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, two-thirds of the incoming BRI investment into China uh, goes through uh, Singapore, and one-third of the outgoing investment goes through Singapore. So we've become a major participant uh, uh, in BRI. And in the, process, in the process of BRI, a lot more infrastructure is going to be built in Asia. What I mentioned for Africa, roads, bridges, uh, fast railways, uh, ports, and so on and so forth. And that, at the end of the day, has a positive dynamic. But of course, it also means that your economy becomes more closely tied with China, inevitably. And therefore, you've got to learn to manage that and think about how you ensure that while you collaborate with China economically, you don't, at the, at the end of the day, don't lose your independence. And that's going to be a big challenge for all of uh, China's neighbors because uh, it, that's what happens when great powers emerge. But as I can tell you, if you have a chance, read the book by Graham Allison, a Harvard professor. Uh, it just came out. It's called... The reason I'm writing a book on U.S. and China is to reply to Graham Allison's book. His book is called Destined for War. He thinks U.S. and China are destined for war. I don't think they are destined for war, that they can be in most of MD. But one of the most interesting passages in that book, which I quote so often, is he says in the book, and I, the words are something like this. He said, many Americans wish that China could be like us, be like America. He says... Be careful what you wish for. Because in 1898, when America was emerging as a great power, and when Teddy Roosevelt became Secretary of the Navy, he said in the next 10 years, the United States uh, uh, almost went to war with Britain and Germany. Uh, it colonized a few countries. It uh, changed governments in six countries. He said, watch out. If China behaves like the United States, you will have a very turbulent world that is coming. So therefore, it's in our interest, therefore, to go back to my very, very first point at about Bill Clinton, it's very important now that you, you in a sense, teach the China how to behave as a number one power, and therefore how the number one power behaves today will influence how the next number one power behaves tomorrow. Well, well, very sl small remark, but I think it's an important question you raise about multilateralism. And you, before you said we live in a global village and we need a global village council. And fortunately, we have one, the Security Council, and mm. you were involved there yourself. Um, and you plead, I think, for good reasons, for a reform of the Security Council. This has been... This would be, of course, a great symbol of the acknowledgement about what you are writing mm. in the last 20 years. Mm. Now, I see the ambivalence of France and Britain not wanting to give up their permanent seat, but I also see an ambivalence of China in its relation to other emerging countries, like Japan, for example. Mm. I see ambivalence in the African Union, who has vetoed some of the reform proposals because it wasn't a guarantee for African countries enough. So is there any way in which this, which would be a great symbol, a hopeful symbol, for really mm. people in the world acknowledging that the world order is mm. changing, whether this composition of the Security Council will be successful? You raised the question also in your last book, also in this book, but do you see any way forward there beyond? What you yeah. could imagine, you know, Japan, Brazil, etc., those countries in the security car. Is there any way of really achieving that in the next, mm. say, 10 years? Yeah. Uh, I must say, I, I'm not sure about 10 years. I, but I, I, I can tell you for certain that the, that the, 
the Security Council composition will have to change sometime because the Security Council is going to face a big tension yeah. between its composition and its credibility. Yeah. If the composition doesn't change, if it continues to reflect yesterday's powers, then if tomorrow's powers are not involved, I mean, the day, if, let's say if India announces that it will no longer abide by the decisions of the UN Security Council, the P5 cannot press India. It's yeah. too big. So th that's why you've got to bring India inside. Now, but it's, it's, as you know, it's a very, I, I spent 10 years working on Security Council reform, so I know how difficult <laughs> the subject is. But one reason why Security Council reform hasn't happened, well, at least one reason, for every country that wants to come in, there's a neighbor that says, why not me? So if uh, Brazil wants to come, come in, Argentina says, why not me? If India wants to come in, Pakistan says, why not me? But the most amusing one was the uh, comment I heard in the United Nations one, one, because Germany and Japan were pushing very hard to become permanent members. So the Italian ambassador, Paolo Fulci, stood up and he says, why are you all pushing for Germany and Japan to become permanent members? We, Italy, we lost World War II also. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. <laughs> but, you know, there's this jealousy of the neighbours. That's why, as you know, in my book, I proposed the uh, 777 formula. Yeah. And the, the, the advantage of the 777 formula is that for, every, for the new members of the Security mm. Council, their neighbours become semi-permanent members, right? Pakistan, Argentina get rotated every four yeah, terms. Yeah, yeah. So we, instead of creating a two-tier council, you create a three-tier council. Yeah, yeah. And I think that will be a better one. So that's just one formula that I've suggested. But I want to, just if you don't mind, emphasise one very, very critical point about multilateralism. The one region in the world that has built the best multilateral institutions by far is the European Union. And it actually is very puzzling to me that the European Union members who appreciate multilateralism have, do, have not had the courage to stand up to America when America undermines multilateralism because it goes against your interest to do so. So I actually think, that if you ask me why I wrote this book now, if this is going to be the multilateral moment in world history, and it has to be, then the natural leader of this multilateral moment is the most competent uh, region in the world on multilateralism, which is the European Union. So there is a tremendous leadership opportunity today for the European countries to tell the world, okay, if we want to start building stronger global multilateral institutions, this is how you do it. And you know, I can tell you one thing, as, a, as someone who was an ambassador in the UN for 10 years, I find conversations and dialogue do make a big difference, you know. When you talk to each other daily on a face-to-face -face basis, you understand each other. He said, okay, I think we can reach a deal. If my understanding is correct, your bottom line concerns are ABC. Okay, I'll meet your bottom line concerns, A, B, C. Now let me tell you what my bottom line concerns are, D, E, F. You accommodate my bottom line, I accommodate your bottom line, let's make a deal. It can be done. And, and, and that's what multilateralism is about. But you see, the United States became so unilateral at the end of the Cold War. It lost all its multilateral instincts. Uh, you, and, you know, of course, the answer to this plaidoyer is that you cannot live by soft power alone. So yeah. the scramble for, of the European Union is how to balance this idea of attracting as a model mm. and exercising influence by being what it is. Mm. And on the other hand, of course, being engaged in security questions, building up an independent capacity mm. to act. Very difficult balance because on the one hand, the soft power unites Europe, but the quest for hard power could tear Europe apart famous question of Kissinger, give me a telephone number and I will call Europe mm. to consult. Where is the capital of Europe? It's certainly not Brussels, it's not Berlin. Where is the capital of Europe? And so the, the, the big question for Europe, how in a world where hard power is still 
Mm. Look at China wanting to build aircraft carriers. Mm. Looking at the United States, mm. look at Brazil, look at India. Mm. They're all engaged in scramble also for hard power. So that is, mm. I think, the haunting question for the European Union. But hard power is a sunset industry, as I told you in my statistics on wars. Yeah, yeah. And I can take bets with any of you, there'll be no wars between any two major powers because it's completely suicidal. Because if China and United States go to war with each other, China and United States will both be destroyed and the rest of the world may carry on, assuming the nuclear fallout doesn't hit all of us. Uh, but therefore, the, the, the kind of, th this is exactly what's wrong with our decision making. Mm. Uh, in our decision making, we are still using 19th century mental concepts in the 21st century. And the idea that you can win a war between the United States and China is impossible. Both sides will lose, and they know that. Hard power is a sunset industry. The sunset industry? Yeah, a sunset industry. That's a so. wonderful quote. I, hope so. I, think, um, I, think it, I think it's I think it's true, and I hope it's true. Um, <laughs> Thank you very, very much for um, engaging in conversation and um, for um, sharing your insights. And I would have to say your wisdom with us. With us. That's very, very, very... I've been deeply touched again by your um, insights in what I think is one of the most successful endeavors in human history, the European Union, and still is. I think um, if we listen to you, you can hear many, many things which the Union has to offer. I think we cannot stress that enough in this part of the world, where um, some people seem to think that um, uh, uh, Europe is actually a sunset industry. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us uh, in conversation. I'd just like to mention only that um, this is a series of lectures um, uh, the, the Bali calls the Bali Invites. We've in, we're inviting um, uh, the main intellectuals addressing the sort of the main issues in the world today. We've had Zainab El Razoui from Paris here um, a few weeks ago. We will have uh, Mark Lilla in the first days of June. And this was Kishore Mabubani. It's been made possible by our circle of friends, the, the friends of the free word, word of the free speech, who are private citizens who uh, sustain us to do this lecture series. And uh, it's been very, very, very honoring and extremely kind of you to share your insights and wisdom with us, Dr. Mabubani, Professor Treffer. Thank you very much for coming.